Among the tragedies of the American bombing of Japan in 1945 was the loss of a painting of five sunflowers by Van Gogh, Japan's favorite artist. Twenty-two and a half million. At twenty-two and a half million pounds. Last time, at twenty-two and a half million pounds, at twenty-two million five hundred thousand pounds for the last time. Lot 43, this painting of 14 sunflowers by Van Gogh, made almost three times the previous record price for a picture. An export license in all probability will be applied for. The buyer was from Japan, the Yasuda Fire and Marine Insurance Company of Tokyo. But had they bought a new national treasure or an expensive fake? Is there any doubt about its authenticity? <laughs> <laughs> what a time to ask. <laughs> no, I don't think there is. The authenticity question may have seemed a joke at the time, but doubts were already being expressed. It's a very funny, muddy picture. And it, it, Vincent van Gogh was not muddy. OK, you said, well, it's, it needs to be cleaned and all that. That's not the case. There's something, it's not put together, and it doesn't have that snap. The latest fake scandal hit the auction rooms when Van Gogh's Garden at Auvers was put up for sale in Paris. Press coverage of the sale sparked a media witch hunt of suspicious Van Goghs. It had been suggested that the garden was a fake before the sale, but the auctioneers carried on regardless. The bidding didn't go high enough and it wasn't actually sold. Richard Rodriguez, a French lawyer and connoisseur, thought it should never have been put up for auction in the first place. He objected, saying a recently published book doubted the picture's authenticity. Since I was told the sunflowers was a fake back in 1987, I've been longing to have a go at it. As a journalist, fakes have always been my speciality. The Van Gogh fakes were made at the turn of the century, shortly after his death. They got muddled up with his real work, and everyone's assumed ever since that they were genuine. Today, this has produced a fantastic model. Estimates of the number of fakes have gone as high as 100. Leading scholars agree that the fakes exist, but they fight among themselves over which they are and complain bitterly about each other's ignorance in private. The Van Gogh Museum has an embargo on certain family documents. No one has been allowed access to some of the key evidence. Museums and sale rooms hide behind confidentiality clauses. There's just too much money and too many reputations at stake. The case of the Yasuda sunflowers highlights all these problems. The painting was unwrapped in Tokyo, with all the respect due to the greatest painter in the world and an enormous sum of money. The evidence against this picture seems to me overwhelming. There are three versions of this vase of 14 sunflowers. Vincent often copied his own pictures, so on the face of it, there is nothing surprising about him repeating the subject. But the Yasuda painting is the only one not mentioned in his letters, the only one that is unsigned, and is thought by connoisseurs to be visually inferior to the other two. There are no doubts about the version in the London National Gallery, which was painted in August 1888. It was bought directly from the Van Gogh family. The Yasuda picture is a copy of it, whether by Vincent or not. For a period in the 1980s, the Yasuda painting hung on loan alongside the original. Everyone could see it was not as good.
The third painting of 14 sunflowers has never left the family collection and is now in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. The almost daily letters that Vincent wrote to his art dealer brother Theo never mention the Yasuda picture, only the London and Amsterdam versions. There are essentially three ways to investigate whether a painting is a fake. By visual comparison, by studying documentary evidence and by scientific tests. All of them will be needed if an answer is to be found to the Yasuda mystery. The person who has spent more time than anyone else chasing documentary evidence on the fakes is Benoit Londay. He was not trained as an art historian, but has been working on Van Gogh for the past seven years. He is convinced that the Yasuda sunflowers is not by Van Gogh. On two versions, there are three petals on the flower, the, the version of London and the version now in Tokyo. In the other one, of Amsterdam, there are two. So this, t these two are now connected. Now, if you look on, on the enlargement of the cover of the catalog when it was sold, the yellow here is put over the brown, which is on the background. And that is true everywhere, OK? It's not the way Vincent was working, because he was working by colours. I wouldn't say it isn't a fake without having seen it and having made very definite studies about it, but I couldn't be sure. I cannot tell, really tell, uh, decide uh, uh, everything for sure. But for me, if you want to decide anything, you should have to do a lot of technical research for the outcome to know exactly what's what. So you don't actually exclude the possibility that this is by a different hand. You just say that you haven't seen it. Yes. And um, it's a whole puzzle that still needs to be studied. Yes. yes. And when I got this uh, catalog, uh, I remember having said to uh, Miss Norman, uh, look, uh, it's a funny thing, I got a special catalogue by Christie of a star painting that they are going to sell, and for me it's a copy done by a, a clumsy artist. The man who first challenged the sunflowers in public is a Milanese quantity surveyor, Antonio de Robertis. The study of Van Gogh is for him a passionate hobby. His knowledge won him 100 million lira, about 50,000 pounds, from a TV quiz in 1990. He has put all his doubts about the sunflowers on the internet and is the bit noir of professional scholars. Unlike them, he wants to make a big public issue of it. I am absolutely convinced che questo quadro eh, non sia di Van Gogh. Ci sono eh, troppe eh, prove che me lo, mi hanno convinto. Innanzitutto questo quadro non è mai citato nella corrispondenza di Vincent a suo fratello. Sì. Nonostante eh, Van Gogh citi per ben 27 volte parli dei girasoli nelle lettere fatte al fratello, in nessuna di queste 27 lettere, di queste 27 citazioni, si parla mai di questo quadro. I'm very interested in the new theories. I think they're, they're very, um, they're filled with Sherlock Holmes. And we all like a great mystery. We all like a great sensationalist uh, whodunit. But sadly, um, the stylistic grounds in this case uh, I think could be accounted for several reasons. One, it could be that it was a painting that was possibly more um, mishandled. The other probable issue is that the Sunflowers is a work which we all expect to be brilliant, but it has suffered. To unravel the mystery, we need to look at Vincent's life. 
The sunflowers were painted in Arles, a little town in the south of France where he moved in February 1888. By that time he was 35 and had been painting for eight years. The son of a Dutch pastor, he had worked in an art gallery, then became a preacher. He was always emotionally unstable and neither career suited him. He was a slow developer as a painter and it was only when he reached Arles that the great period of his work began. He painted the surrounding landscape and the town itself, particularly the cafe run by his friends, the Roulins. He never had enough money, but he managed to drink quite heavily and became a habitué of the local brothels. The townspeople considered him a curiosity. He sent his paintings in batches to his art dealer brother Theo in Paris, to whom he wrote almost daily about his work. The letters are crucial evidence when chasing fakes. Vincent dreamed of bringing other painters to Arles and establishing a studio of the South. He took over half a derelict house known as the Yellow House. Only Gauguin actually came to join Vincent. It was to decorate Gauguin's room in the Yellow House that Vincent painted his famous series of sunflower pictures. I turned to Alain Tarica, the man who had first told me the Yasuda sunflowers was a fake, for a visual explanation of what's wrong with the picture. The one we are going to speak a lot about. He is a Paris art dealer who has a formidable reputation as a fake spotter. Colleagues in the trade and museum curators bring him their problems. He told me that it would be easier to explain if he could show the three pictures together, so we had replicas made. First out of the wrapping came the Yasuda picture, the one Tarika calls a fake. It was followed by the sunflowers from the London National Gallery. The third is the picture from the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. These three pictures have never been seen side by side before. Tarika showed us how the faker had misunderstood what Van Gogh was painting. Here we see, for instance, this sleeve, you see? This sleeve here is made of two kinds of greens and it's attached normally to the stem. Here also we see the green leaf here, which is attached normally to the stem here. It's made only with one kind of green, but uh, it's still alive. But here, it's like if the stem was going through, was, uh, going, was crossing the leaf. We have the feeling that the stem is going through the leaf. And, and this is abnormal in the nature, in the real nature. The leaf doesn't grow on the stem this way. That's another mistake that the painter did while he tried to repeat the image which is there. For instance, here we see um, the stem here, which is broken, you see? And here, the stem it has continuity, it's normal, and here also the same. This stem between those two flowers and respecting the life of each of the elements. Here, the painter had a problem of disposing the stem you know, which means that this flower now is holding on a stem which is broken and the degree of life, I would say, the degree of life, the evolution of life of the flower doesn't correspond to the evolution of the stem. And there are other elements, for instance, in the center flower here, um, when Van Gogh painted it, of course the petals are tight to the center part of the flower. If we look at the copy that he did, which is in Amsterdam, we find, of course, the same phenomenon, which is the petals of the center flower are connected to the center part of the flower. If we look now at the Yasuda painting, we see the petals here are not connected with the center part, because they are painted with thick impastos. The painter could not 
handle the thick brush stroke here to connect it correctly with the center part of the flower. He could not paint like that and make all of these mistakes which we have seen, which are clumsy, which correspond to the clumsiness of uh, the handling of thick impastos. And for him, hand, painting with thick impastos was not a way, was not difficult because it's not that he had learned it some way, that's how he was writing with paint. For all of these reasons, I think that uh, this painting is a fake painting done by a clumsy artist. You know, the sunflower is a life-giving flower. <clears throat> it also produces uh, oil, but it also produces uh, turpentine for painting. It's an artist's medium as well, which I didn't really know about. But in Arles, when Van Gogh painted these works, he painted them mainly because they were yellow. And I think by this time he had a very careful, symbolic association with certain colors. And yellow for him definitely was represented as a life-giving color associated with the sun and nature, but also with love and gratitude. Uh, symbol of life, but also anticipation of Gauguin's arrival, because as you know, he painted these sunflowers for the decoration of the yellow house. It remained, as he said in his, one of his last letters to Albert Aurier, the critic, he says, you know, every artist has had his certain flower, Father Quost had the hollyhock. I have the sunflower. So somehow he associated himself for, I'm sure, a lot of iconographic and spiritual reasons and naturalistic reasons and artistic reasons with the sunflower. But they are definitely integrated with his preparation of the welcome to Gauguin to come to Arles. They arrived the day before yesterday. Well, I, I fixed this room up for you. Oh. It's very nice. But the stormy artistic temperaments clashed, and famously, Vincent cut off part of the lobe of one ear in an attempt at emotional blackmail. 
this nervous storm landed him in an asylum in nearby Saint-Rémy. He often painted in the asylum garden, and some of his best pictures date from this period. A year later, apparently recovered, he moved north to Auvers-sur-Oise, where he lived and painted for two months. He loved the big open skies and the cornfields. But it was a difficult time since Theo had just got married and Vincent felt that he was losing his brother's affection and support. In a fit of depression, he went out into the countryside and shot himself. Vincent died after two days of agony. He was carried to his grave with sunflowers on his coffin. His brother Theo inherited all his paintings, but shattered by what had happened, also lost his reason and only survived Vincent by six months. They are buried side by side in the hilltop cemetery at Auvers. With Theo's death, all first-hand knowledge of why, how and when the pictures were painted was lost. By unanimous family consent, ownership of all Vincent's pictures was passed to Theo's one-year-old son, Vincent Willem van Gogh. This meant that Theo's widow, Johanna, who was 28 at the time, found herself in charge of almost all her brother-in-law's paintings. And it was this young Dutch woman who put Vincent on the map. She built the van Gogh myth by laboriously transcribing his letters. Vincent and Theo had written to each other several times a week, and Theo kept all the letters he received. The letters give a vivid account, in words and pictures, of what Vincent was doing and feeling. And, of course, whether he mentions a picture and how he describes it is crucial evidence for fake spotters. All the sunflower pictures are mentioned in the letters, except for the Yasuda version. In contemporary documents, all of them get referred to just as tournesol, the French for sunflowers making it difficult to work out which picture is being talked about. This happens with Joanna's inventory of paintings inherited from Vincent. If you accept that the Yasuda painting is genuine, then there are not enough sunflower entries on her list. It was the Paris exhibition of 1901 at the Bernheim Jeune Gallery that finally established his reputation. It also gives us a vital clue to the identity of the man who may have made a large number of the suspected fakes. There were 65 pictures in the exhibition catalogue, all borrowed from Paris dealers and collectors, and 11 of them are now suspected of being fakes. It included three sunflower pictures, Yasuda was number five, and the catalogue tells us that it was lent by Claude Emile Schuffenecker, a minor artist who was a friend of Gauguin. For the last few days of the show, the London version was also exhibited. It is the first photograph in the gallery's album. It arrived late because Schuffenecker had been restoring it for Johanna. Schuffenecker is our prime suspect. He had the opportunity to make a copy while he was restoring the London painting. The sunflowers, for me, I can only tell you that from having examined it closely, I can talk about it from the point of view of Schuffenecker's life and, and skills. The opportunity to do it was there. The skill to do it was certainly there. I have no question about that. Uh, the intention to do it as a copy might have been there. The intention to do it as a forgery was quite another thing. Jill Grossvogel was the curator of an exhibition of Schuffenecker's own work at the Prioré Museum in Saint-Germain-en-Laye in the autumn of 1996. He had a very good eye. He really was the initiator of the collections of Gauguin's work and, and Vincent's work at the beginning. He painted in a way that represented his training. His earliest training was quite academic. But he was very open, he remained very open, and so he moved from one pattern of painting into another with relative ease because he was trying to locate his own persona. 
He was a highly intelligent, and highly cultured, and highly complicated individual. I think he is someone who certainly investigated the contradictions. That is to say, how is it that it was possible to recognize the genius in a work by Cézanne, or Gauguin, or Van Gogh, or Redon, and yet not be able to assume his rightful place alongside these giants. I think this was a major awareness he had all his life. Schoffenegger's daughter was to inherit several Van Gogh fakes. Her father had the classic psychological profile of the faker, an artist so bitter at his own lack of recognition that he makes fakes to prove connoisseurs can't tell the difference. In his own mind, that makes him just as good as the artists he imitates. This picture was painted by Gauguin, who was a close friend and often lived with the family in Paris. He is said to have had an affair with Schoffenecker's wife, who later demanded a divorce, possibly the financial motive for the fakes. Another suspected fake that has close links with the Schoffenecker family is Vincent's self-portrait with a bandaged ear, now in the Courtauld Gallery, London. I think it's an absolute forgery. It's made as a forgery. And it's not only the quality of the painting, which I think is very inferior to the other one. If you see how clear this image is, the, the head here, the clear eyes, he, he writes his brother, you see from the self-portrait that my, my health is absolutely restored now because I'm absolutely clear. And it's to be seen in this painting. If you look here, he looks haggard. And he never paints himself haggard. When he is working, he's intent on what he is doing and he is very clear-headed. Also, the pen's mouse hasn't ma doesn't make any sense, but there's no pipe to... To pinch the mouth out To pinch the mouth uh, there. Idiotic. So if you look at this painting, this is a marvelous painting, you have to realize that Vincent was a true realist. If he painted himself, he painted himself as it was at the time. Here you see he has cut his ear and he is, there is a bandage here. And the bandage is put in place by a piece of linen or going all around. If you look here at this painting, there is no bandage. There is only the linen going all around. The father doesn't realize how situ the situation was. Have you any idea who might have painted that if it's not by Van Gogh? No. No. I, I, because forgers uh, aren't used to, to announce themselves as such. Emil Schoffenecker owned the genuine picture at one time and made this copy of it, now in the Van Gogh Museum. So he could easily have made a forgery as well. Christie's commissioned a promotional film showing the successful marketing of the Yasuda painting and how they had checked its provenance. They might not have been so pleased to find a Schoffenecker inscription had they known more about his reputation. One of the first steps with every work of art that comes for auction at Christie's is physical appraisal. That is incredible. I think it is. Look, I think it is. Flowers here where the paint really stands out. Exposition. This rigorous examination of the painting will establish, or in the case of the Van Gogh, confirm its authenticity. And here the owner's name. Bruce Yeah, one eight four, Mr. Schuppenecker. Scholarly research is vital to sort out what happened nearly a hundred years ago. This makes the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam and its extensive archives crucially important to all potential detectives. Vincent's enormous popularity, particularly with the Japanese, means that this tiny museum gets 700,000 visitors a year. It is a family museum. Vincent's nephew inherited all the pictures when he was one year old. As an old man in 1962, 
he arranged that the Dutch government would build a museum where the family paintings could hang. They now belong to a foundation, controlled by the Van Gogh family, but funded by the state. The family is very sensitive about evidence which reflects badly on their forebears and have consistently denied scholars access to certain key documents. The museum is still a stumbling block to sorting out the fake problem. Now, one of the things that I've been trying to work out is whether it was this sunflower or the London one that was sent to the 1901, no, to the 1900 World Fair mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that Leclerc had and put mm -hmm. into the 1901 mm -hmm. exhibition. The museum recruited a new director in 1997, John Layton from the London National Gallery, who is struggling to be more open. But he has to work within the traditional limitations. John, do you feel that you can discuss with us the um, debate about the authenticity of the Yasuda sunflowers? Uh, we have a very clear policy on the discussing works of art and the attribution of works of art that belong to uh, other people. Uh, and uh, without the express permission of the owner, I wouldn't feel uh, confident or happy about doing that. So I'm afraid not. The museum is currently building a new wing. It is financed by the Yasuda Fire and Marine Insurance Company of Tokyo, out of gratitude for the popularity and profits that the purchase of the sunflowers has brought them. Yasuda has contributed $37.5 million. Under these circumstances, it is difficult to believe that the Van Gogh Museum could give an unbiased opinion on the authenticity of the painting. The first big fake scandal erupted in Berlin in 1928. There was a loan exhibition at the prestigious Paul Cassira Gallery, specialists in modern art, which included several pictures from the dealer Otto Wacker. Mariana Feichenfeld remembers what happened when these pictures arrived. It suddenly realized that they were painted by one person, but not by Van Gogh, not by the same person as the other paintings. And then, of course, the whole thing exploded very quickly. Berlin was a very gossipy town. Everybody wanted to keep secret, but it was quite impossible. It came to the press very soon, and people who had bought these pictures brought them to be taken back. And as everybody knows, there were a trial much later. I remember that my husband, his firm, Paul Cassira, never had bought one of these paintings, but not at all because he didn't believe in it, but he didn't like them. He always said they were dull and without the real Van Gogh colouring, but people bought them after all. One didn't doubt paintings at that time. It was not used that they were fakes. And did you meet Vaca himself? No, only at the trial. I saw him first time at the trial when he told everybody that he was a dancer by the name of Olindo Lovell. <laughs> I don't know why I kept this name in my mind. I must say it was very exciting because all the famous art historians were giving their opinion and every time changed their opinion. Vaca, who never admitted his guilt, was jailed for 19 months and fined. Some of his pictures had been bought by major collectors. The Cassiore exhibition was to celebrate the publication of the first complete catalogue of Van Gogh's work, compiled by a Dutchman called Bart de la Faye. His book is still the Van Gogh Bible. He started work on it because people were already getting muddled about fakes, and he hoped to clear things up. But the first edition actually contained 33 of the Vaca fakes. Seven years later, la Faye had to publish another book, titled Le Faux Van Gogh, the fake Van Goghs. It contained the Vaca paintings and many others. It requires it a bit of strength. Oops. Gosh, well, I don't uh, touch there that we have in another case. Key. Oh. Please, come in. Thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> <laughs> One of the major collectors of the pre war years was Mrs. Cruella Muller and her museum in the Dutch countryside contains an even greater collection of Van Goghs than the Van Gogh Museum itself. It also contains a lot of mistakes. 
the curator has had the courage to remove them from the main gallery and tuck them away in store. Hello, one rack. Good Lord. So this is a whole rack of, um, of yes. Van Gogh. Got, yes. I mean, fake Van Goghs. Yes. Fantastic. Well, at least works that are no longer attributed to Van Gogh. To mm -hmm. Make it a little to bit make more a little subtle. Difference. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, this yeah. one dates back to the great scandal of the 1920s, doesn't it? Yes. Was it in the Berlin show in 28? Yes, oh, yes. Okay. Uh, many of the problematic paintings uh, are flower paintings. Uh, you have little documentary proof about any painting. Um, so this gives a lot of opportunity for uh, people to be creative. <laughs> And then these two were moving right on, aren't we? That's certainly supposedly Saint Remy, isn't it? Yes. Can you explain why that says to you that it's not, may not be by Van Gogh? Uh, when you see it amongst the other works, uh, uh, it would be easier to explain this difference. Uh, uh. So you see it when it's hanging upstairs more vividly than when it's down here. Yes, that's the tragedy with many mm. fakes, uh, that mm. uh, in order to show that they are fakes, you better show them <laughs> in the real gallery. <laughs> but uh, after you have decided not to do... Um, then you've uh, taken them out of their yes, context. Yes, yeah. mm. It would be nice if we would have something like uh, DNA for a painting. Um, but something like that doesn't exist. Mm. The Musée d'Orsay in Paris has a group of paintings given to the nation in the 1950s by Paul Gachet, son of the doctor who looked after Vincent in Auvergne. There are eight paintings supposedly by Van Gogh, some of which are now thought to be fakes. They may even have been painted by the doctor himself. This is, um, as it were, the key picture. Yes, of course. Um, One of them. Andy Stell, who is Orsay's chief curator, is deeply concerned by the problem. It's both a painting of Gachet, who is now, it's questioned whether he may have uh, painted some of the Van Goghs himself. Also, there is no record of there being a second version. 74 million. <laughs> 75 million. 75 million. The first version was auctioned at Christie's New York in May 1990 and made the highest price for any picture ever. $75 million for you, sir. The Gachet portrait was bought by a Japanese billionaire who died in 1996. One of the world's greatest pictures, it has been out of sight in a bank vault for more than seven years. There are two paintings of Dr. Gachet, two portraits that are very similar. One that was sold recently and is now in Japan, and one in the Musée d'Orsay. What do you think about them? One is genuine and the other is not. This one is the good one. <clears throat> but we can find in the, in the painting itself the, the proof of the hand of the master. The landscape is mixed to the portrait by the fact the line is quite the same line and the same colours are changing a bit but they are the same colours coming on it and the same shape. And to, to make a wedding between the coat of Gachet and the digitalis, you can see it's quite the same kind of shape three times. The coat and the flower. The, 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 the coat and the flower. There are two, in fact. And also, this colour is the same as that, and this colour is also the same. Okay. That all is lost in the copy. If you see this painting in a flea market, you never think it can be a Van Gogh if you don't know the other. Why? The colours are in conflict, so it's aggressive, no melancholy. The head of Gachet is not anymore in the corner, but it's not anymore, or the, the arm, skinny at all. They tried, you can see, they tried to do it 
There is absolutely no reason to imagine that Vincent could have done this thing. And more than that, we know that on 15th of, of, of June, uh, th there was only one portrait of Geshe, because in the letter he says, I have now one portrait of Geshe. And because it's so far from the work of Vincent, I'm sure it's a copy. In Auvergne, Vincent stayed in a little auberge run by the Ravou family. He lived there for just over two months and is credited with having painted 83 pictures, which means more than a picture a day. Some of them must be fakes and were probably painted by the Gachet circle. Dr. Gachet was a painter and so was his son Paul, known as Coco. After he had shot himself, Vincent struggled back to the auberge, mortally wounded. Adeline Bravo, the, the daughter of the innkeeper, has seen that he was blessed. That's why uh, she came up to his room to, just to check what happened. And then they called the local doctor, and the local doctor didn't want to take care of Vincent because everybody in the village knew it was Dr. Gachet who takes care for the painters. So Dr. Gachet came over, and then when he had seen that there was nothing to do, he asked the neighbor, uh, Urshik, to go to Paris to pick up Theo. So Theo arrived at about 12 o'clock, and at 1 o'clock in the morning he died here, in his room. Now Dr. Gachet came over with his son, and he said to his son, roll Coco, because the more he was rolling the paintings, the more he could bring, uh, bring back home. And that's how he got a collection of paintings of Van Gogh, which are today in the Orsay Museum. Dr. Gachet and his son seemed to have taken as many paintings as they could. Gachet specialized in mental illness and homeopathy, but had been a keen amateur painter since his student days. His home attracted many artists, including Renoir, Pizarro and Cezanne, who came to him for medical advice and loved experimenting with his etching press. Dr. Gachet died in 1909, but his son lived on in the house, becoming more and more eccentric and reclusive. He never had a job and seems to have lived off selling the pictures and antiques that his father had crammed into the house. One villager who has devoted her life to the study of local history is Madame Claude Millon. Uniquement qu'il ne tolérait pas que des personnes d'Auvergne rentrent dans sa maison. Même les commerçants, même la personne qui faisait la lessive. Et comment il a, il a pu vivre comme ça Parce qu'il faut manger, il faut... Um... C'est un mystère. Beaucoup de choses sont un mystère dans la vie de cet homme dont on peut penser qu'il est surtout le fils de son père. He kept very quiet about the Van Goghs until he made a series of donations to French national collections in the 1950s. His gifts, now in the Musée d'Orsay, include works by Van Gogh, Renoir, Pizarro and Cézanne. He also gave the nation paintings by his father and himself. He signed his pictures, including copies of works by other artists, with the pseudonym Louis Van Rissel. His father called himself Paul Van Rissel. The museum has reacted to the controversy by having the Gachet van Gogh scientifically investigated and announcing that they will mount an exhibition of all Gachet's donations to public institutions in the autumn of 1998. This is sure to spark another explosive argument. You have seen when you walk up to the cemetery, the countryside is exactly how it was 100 years ago. Japanese. They don't come only to visit, but also to bring offers for Vincent. And on certain days we just clean the cemetery and you have a lot of little bottles of sake, brushes, and also a lot of Japanese uh, who die in, in Japan, their dream is to be buried with Vincent. So a lot of Japanese bring over the ashes here and then they put it on the graves. 
from Vincent and Theo. The number of Japanese tourists who come to worship at the Van Gogh Shrine in Auvers got a big boost when Yasuda bought the sunflowers in 1987. It will be a terrible disappointment to the nation if they discover their famous sunflower picture is not really by Van Gogh. What do you think Yasuda are going to say if they actually have to face the fact that they are landed with a fake? Oh, I don't think they'll face it. I think they hope it'll go away. I do not think that the people in charge of the insurance company are going to let regiments of experts in to take it off the exhibition and look at it and maybe even do some analysis and so on. I just don't think they're going to do that. I think it would be a very great loss of face. I think the picture was purchased because the only other Vincent van Gogh in Japan prior to the United States firebombing of Tokyo was a sunflowers, which was destroyed. It is said that the painting was relined after its arrival in Japan, which may mean that important evidence has been lost. We asked Yasuda if we could talk to them about this and their views on the sunflowers problem. Yasuo Goto, the chairman of the company, replied, We have no intention of participating in any discussion of sunflowers' authenticity, as we hold no doubts whatsoever that it is genuine. We also have no intention of answering the questions mentioned in your letter. I personally find it impossible to believe that the Yasuda sunflowers is by Van Gogh. There's too much evidence against it. It's not mentioned in the letters or other early documents. It first appears in the hands of Emil Schuffenecker, whose name has long been linked with faking. And it is generally agreed that it is visually inferior to the other two. It does disturb me, however, that so many experts still think it genuine. They aren't talking to each other and don't know each other's arguments, which is why the model persists. If the experts, the Van Gogh Foundation and Mr. Goto from Yasuda, could be persuaded to divulge what they know, the truth about the Yasuda picture could be found. Using secrecy to protect their reputations and huge investments just won't do. 22 million, 22 and a half million. Christie's has both money and reputation at stake and has opted for silence. They refuse to be interviewed and issued a statement saying, we see no reason on the evidence so far produced to alter our original opinion that the Sunflowers is an authentic work by Van Gogh. You don't ever get a concert of opinion in, in art. Very seldom do you get it. And so this, I think, will just kind of go on forever. And since it's not going to ever be for resale, does it matter? Most of us who know Van Gogh, and I think a lot of us do, or profess to know a lot about Van Gogh, know that this very simple man, filled with great humility and compassion for mankind, saw these works as different legacies than financial ones. I think he would be horrified and uh, distraught beyond anything you can imagine to see himself somersaulted to such tremendous value and such crass commercialism, I think it would have been something that he couldn't have ever tolerated. <laughs>